500 years ago, Nicholas Copernicus transformed the way we think about our place in the universe. Arguing against the doctrine of the time, he said that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe, and that the earth goes around the sun. Suddenly, our world lost its place at the center of creation, becoming just one planet among many. This insight had a profound impact on how people thought about nature, whose effects were felt for two centuries later. We, today, we may be on the brink of a new Copernican revolution, but this time, the key discoveries won't come from looking up into the vastness of space, but from looking down to the smallest building blocks of matter. I'm a particle physicist, which means I'm interested in tiny, tiny things, subatomic particles, the things from which you and I, and as far as we know, everything in the universe are made. And the machine that's brought us to the edge of this revolution is the Large Hadron Collider. It's the largest scientific device ever constructed by the human race, a 27-kilometer circumference particle accelerator. It's so ridiculously huge that a city could fit inside its footprint. What the LHC does is really rather simple and kind of brutal. It takes particles called protons and whizzes them round and around and round in a circle, getting faster and faster. And when they're going at 99.999991% of the speed of light, they're smashed into each other. And in those collisions, new exotic particles are created that don't normally exist in nature. And people like me try to study and understand them. This is an aerial shot of the countryside just outside Geneva on the border between France and Switzerland. In the background, you can see the Alps, that high peak is Mont Blanc. And marked in yellow on the countryside is the route of the LHC. Uh, that yellow line's not there in real life, though. It would have annoyed a lot of farmers. Um, the LHC is actually underground. If you go 100 meters below the surface, this is what you see, a very, very long blue tube curving away into the distance. This is the Large Hadron Collider itself. If you follow the tunnel around, at four points around the ring, it opens up into a vast subterranean cavern, housing machines that look like this, sort of like something out of a science fiction movie. This is the compact muon solenoid experiment. Uh, rather strange use of the word compact. This machine is fi five stories high, weighs 12,000 tons, and contains enough iron to build two Eiffel Towers. Um, you can actually see there's a little chappy in a hard hat there for scale. An absolutely enormous machine. This is essentially a gigantic three-dimensional digital camera, packed full of unbelievably precise and sophisticated microelectronics. The particles collide right in the middle of this thing, and its job is to reconstruct a three-dimensional image of what happens in the collision. And when the two protons collide, this is what you get, a load of crap going everywhere, basically. Um, <laughs> It should be emphasized that although we often refer to accelerators at as atom smashers, we're not smashing protons apart to see what's inside them. We're actually creating new matter that doesn't normally exist in the universe through Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared, which tells us that energy and matter can be transformed from one into another. So the LHC is actually a machine for making matter out of energy. Now, Every line in this image represents a subatomic particle, most of which are totally uninteresting, things we've seen many, many times before. But very occasionally, somewhere buried in all this rubbish, may be an exotic new particle that we've never seen before. So why did 10,000 scientists and engineers from all over the world come together, spending billions of euros to build this incredible machine? Well, one answer is, if you get lots of clever people together and ask them to solve an impossible problem, they develop technologies that can have wide applications in the wider world. Um, for example, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN in the 1990s as a way for scientists to share data with one another. And then CERN gave that technology away to the world for free. So in a way, the web alone has paid for the LHC many times over. But if you actually ask a physicist why this machine was built, they'll give you a different answer, which is this machine allows us to explore the world we live in. It allows us to find out more about how the universe works at the most fundamental level. Um, a hero of mine uh, was this man, Richard Feynman. He's already been mentioned earlier today. He was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, a safe cracker, and he played the bongos. Um, he's, he said something, well, he, uh, there's a quote attributed to him, to him. He may or may not have said it, but never let facts get in the way of a good story. The quote is, physics is like sex. Sure, you may get some practical results, but that's not why we do it. Um, <laughs> so if you're a physicist, this is sex. Um, <laughs> or as close as you're likely to come to it most of the time, anyway. Um, 
So what are the specific scientific questions we're trying to answer? Well, over the course of the 20th century, scientists learned a huge amount about how our world is put together at the subatomic level. All this understanding was built into a rather beautiful theoretical structure, one of the triumphs of modern science. It's called the standard model of particle physics. And the standard model describes everything that exists in this world with, very, uh, with great economy. Um, we can understand everything in terms of just three different types of particles. One you may have heard of is the electron. This is a particle that whizzes around the outside of atoms and bonds atoms together. And then there are two other guys called quarks, which make up the center of atoms. And that's it. You are just electrons and quarks, albeit arranged in a rather peculiar way. Um, the standard model also contains a whole bunch of other particles that don't really play a role in ordinary day-to-day -day physics. And finally, on the right-hand side, in yellow, these are the particles that transmit the forces of nature, that glue those other subatomic sub particles together and allow them to change from one type into another. So this was the state of particle physics at the end of the 20th century, but there's one piece missing. In the 1960s, theorists realized there was a serious problem with the theory. It required all the particles to be massless. Now, we know the particles aren't massless. If they were, atoms couldn't form and we wouldn't be here. A solution was found by six different theorists, the most famous of which was this man, Peter Higgs. Their ideas were rather strange. What they said was, imagine that there's an invisible energy field that fills the entire universe. It's all around us right now in this room, but you can't touch it, you can't feel it. As particles move through this energy field, they gain mass. And if you do it this way, you avoided the nasty theoretical problems. The issue is, of course, how do you know this invisible energy field is there or not? Well, in a way, it's a bit like the air in this room. You can't see the air, but one of the ways you know it's there is you can hear my voice traveling through the air to your ear. And my voice is just a ripple in that air. In the same way, if you can create a ripple in this energy field, then you can prove it exists. And that ripple shows up as a new particle, the famous Higgs boson. So one of the main aims of the Large Hadron Collider was to find evidence of the existence of this Higgs boson. Finding it was absolutely crucial, because without it, this entire structure that I've described falls apart. This was the scene at CERN, home of the Large Hadron Collider, on the 4th of July, 2012. This is as excited as you're ever going to see particle physics get, physicists getting. Uh, <laughs> there was clapping, cheering, even the occasional woo. Um, not normal behavior for physicists. The reason they're so excited is that they've just seen two PowerPoint presentations. Uh, we're, we're easily pleased. Um, keep crucially, these were two presentations from two of these giant detectors who had both seen evidence of a new particle that looked just like the Higgs boson predict predicted almost 50 years earlier. So on the 4th of July, 2012, the story of particle physics comes to an end. The standard model is complete. We now know what everything in the universe is made from and how those particles get mass. Well, not quite. Uh, there's a very deep and troubling problem with the standard model, and it's got to do with this invisible energy field, this Higgs field. There are 25 or so different numbers that you have to put into the theory to make it work. These are things like the masses of the different particles and how strong the forces are. You measure those things in experiments, and then you put them into the theory. It turns out that the strength of the Higgs field is incredibly sensitive to exactly what values those take. If you change one of them, like twiddling the dial on a, on a mixing desk, even slightly, you get a universe that's totally unrecognizable. Basically, two things can happen, both of them horrible. One option is the Higgs field becomes incredibly strong, and all the particles in nature become very, very massive, and everything collapses into a black hole, and the universe is just left full of black holes and nothing else. The other option is the Higgs field turns all the way off, all the particles become massless, atoms dissociate, and nothing exists, and therefore no wobbly, flesh-colored things made of atoms like us. It turns out that to get a universe that looks like our own, where the Higgs field is just slightly on, you have to finely tune these different numbers to an absolutely fantastic degree of precision. It looks like the universe has been weirdly set up to allow atoms, and therefore life, to exist. Physicists hate this. We want to be able to explain why the universe looks the way it does. Fortunately, a solution was found. It's an idea called supersymmetry. Supersymmetry has been described as a particle physicist pension plan because it basically doubles the number of fundamental particles. So every particle in the standard model gets a heavier super partner or sparticle, and they all have silly names. So the electron has a partner called the selectron, and the quarks get partners called squarks. Um, 
the key thing about supersymmetry is that it naturally explains why the Higgs field is just slightly on, just enough that we have enough mass for atoms to form, but not so much mass that everything collapses into a black hole. So the other main objective of the Large Hadron Collider has been to search for evidence of these particles. And if they exist, they should show up around the same energy as the Higgs boson. The only problem is, after three years of running the LHC, between 2010 and 2012, no sign of a particle was seen anywhere. This has started to make people feel very worried indeed. Since 2013, the Large Hadron Collider has been switched off for a major upgrade. Engineers have been working round the clock down in the tunnel in order to double, effectively, the energy with which these particles collide. When the machine restarts, we'll be able to produce new particles that weren't possible before and explore a whole new region of the subatomic world. If supersymmetry is there to be found, we should find it. So our field is really now at a fork in the road in its development. One option is that in the next year or two, we find supersymmetry or something like it, and we can explain why the universe looks so bloody weird. The other option is that we find nothing. Now, that might sound like a disaster, but it would have a profound impact on the way we think about our place in the universe, just as profound as when Nicholas Copernicus said that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe. We would have to accept that our universe is strangely fine-tuned for atoms to exist. How would we cope with this? Well, let's imagine a possibly fictional time in history when the only planet people knew about was the Earth and the only star was the Sun. Astronomers might go, hmm, isn't it interesting that the Earth and the Sun are exactly the right distance apart from each other for liquid water to form on the surface of the Earth and therefore for life to exist? And if they only knew about the Sun and the Earth, they might think that distance was some fundamental parameter of their cosmology and they might try to calculate why it had to be that way. Of course, we now know that there are 100 billion stars just in our own galaxy, most of which seem to have their own planetary systems. And in the vast majority of cases, the planets are either too close or too far away from their star for liquid water to form. We live on the Earth because it's one of the few places in the galaxy where we can live. It's because the conditions are right. If we find nothing at the Large Hadron Collider in the next two or three years, we may have to make the same argument with the entire universe. There are reasons for believing that our universe could be one of an effectively infinite number of universes in a larger multiverse. And in all those universes, the laws of physics could be different. In many of those universes, the Higgs field will be all on all the way, and everything will have collapsed into a black hole. In a lot of them, it will be off, and particles will be zipping around, and no atoms, and therefore, no large-scale structures can form. We would live in the universe that we live in because it's one of the very small number of universes where the conditions are right for life. This would be the most radical change in the way we do science since Copernicus. We would have to accept there are some things about nature that we cannot explain. They just happen that way by chance. In a way, it could mark the end of this kind of long march of progress towards the dream of a final theory that might be able to explain everything we see in nature but it would give us an intriguing clue to the existence of universes beyond our own. And since those universes may forever lie beyond the reach of science, it might be the only clue we ever get. So uh, keep your eyes open for developments from the Large Hadron Collider. The next two or three years really are make or break time for physics. Thank you.